Hello and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm Laurie Bull. On today's program, we'll be updating you on the state budget, along with several job creation efforts being pushed in the State House. Here today are State Representative Mark Mustio of the 44th District in Allegheny County and Representative Jim Christiana of the 15th District in Beaver County. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, budget news. Uh, when folks see this, it may already have passed, but at the time of the taping here, um, what are the priorities of House Republicans as this budget process moves forward? Well, I think we both agree that we want to make sure we live in a, within our means, and Governor Corbett uh, certainly has been refreshing from the experiences that we had under eight years of Governor Rendell. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're showing that we can deliver as promised. I think uh, timeliness is important to our county governments and uh, um, the nonprofits that receive state aid. Um, but uh, timeliness, I think, is also a little bit easier when you take taxes off the table and tax increases off the table. You know, my first two years here, we were talking about tax increases almost the whole month of June, and then it wasn't until July, August, or October when a final budget gets passed. So I think the fact that uh, Governor Corbett and House leadership and rank and file like Mark and I say that we're not going to support tax increases, it's off the table from the beginning, I think helps speeds up the process too. And what does timeliness do for school districts, for example, that are, are trying to set their budgets? Well, it helps them. It helps them to be able to plan. Um, also, county governments and the various agencies within the county. Uh, one of the things that I think has been very critical for us um, is, is the timeliness, as, as Jim said. But also, remembering that when Governor Corbett um, presents the budget early on in the year, we still have several more months of tax revenues to come in. And we're fortunate now to see that uh, revenues are starting to increase for various reasons, um, and that's a good thing. Um, knowing that, that there's a little more money than what we thought back in February when the governor presented it, does that change how um, things get done? Does that change the priorities? What, how does that affect the process? I don't think anybody in the General Assembly uh, enjoys the idea that education was cut in Governor Corbett's budget, and I think that was probably a tough decision for him as well. But as Mark said, uh, the revenue shortfall when he introduced his budget versus now, um, you're starting to see those line items restored. And I think if we can restore those line items so that we can hopefully flatline education spending so that they don't have to take a cut. Um, after last year's state increase, I think uh, if we're able to do that despite the tough economic times, I think it shows that we as Republicans uh, prioritize education as the most important investment in tax dollars. Um, and I think uh, those line items getting restored uh, has a lot to do with the economy growing, but also the benefit of the, of the legislature introducing their budget uh, several months after the governor. And, and certainly the best way to help relieve budget pressures is to create jobs and have a booming economy. Um, the natural gas drilling industry has really helped the state as far as that goes. Uh, can you talk about the bill that was passed uh, to, to regulate the industry but also to, to gain some revenue from it? You're talking about Act 13. Yes. And um, you know the spinoff from that I think really is one of the things that Jim Christian has been a leader, leader on and that's the cracker plant that's in the news. Um, you hosted a hearing recently in, in your district that spoke uh, specifically to um, the benefits that Act 13 are going to provide uh, in protecting um, water quality specifically, but also because of the enactment of that and, and some other economic development legislation, we're going to see um, thousands of jobs come into to southwestern Pennsylvania, and, and Jim has been an integral part of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Act 13 um, uh, did a lot for many different many different industries and, and many different types of businesses, whether they're the trucking industry that has benefited from the natural gas or the future of, you know, a 10,000 job cracker plant uh, and uh, the plastics manufacturing coming to Pennsylvania. Uh, Act 13, though, is also, I think, a good litmus test of how politics actually works and policy gets passed. Um, I think there is no perfect bill out there, um, and that bill was meant to penalize those that uh, uh, abuse the environment. It was meant to update our uh, our setback requirements and protect our waterways. 
um, but it was also meant to tell the industry that we're not going to overtax you and overregulate you to extinction. We want you to come here. We want you to have some predictability. And Republicans and Democrats disagreed on how much and and uh, how much to tax. If we should tax, should we have a a, uh, a a tax that goes back to the county governments? It was a long process. I think we we got it right, but we can't just say that the work is done either. We have a tremendous amount of work together, um, whether it's uh, dealing with the environment, taxes, uh, where to spend those dollars that are coming in. Um, it's, uh, it's an industry that's going to be here for a long time, and uh, we are seeing the benefits for, from it. Uh, have you been able to tour one of these facilities, and what have you seen, and, and uh, I guess what impressed you about it, or, or what were your thoughts as you visited? We've toured them several times. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've had the opportunity to do it together, but um, I think the first thing that you're, I'm impressed with anyway is the amount of capital investment, the amount of money that these companies are investing um, just in facilities um, once you go out to, their, to the actual drilling locations. But in, in Moon Township and Robinson Township, parts of my district, um, we have them locating their headquarters there. And, and you're seeing um, just hundreds, almost thousands of jobs being um, generated locally. These are local people. You know, you hear a lot about license plates from other states, but I can tell you that the people that are occupying those offices are primarily from my legislative district and they're working close to home, mm -hmm. which is uh, certainly good in these times of high gas prices. So it's, it's been a real positive. The number of jobs, I think, is really what impresses me most. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, obviously, the, our folks working is important and, and it is the numbers that you hear that by 2015, Pennsylvania will outproduce Texas as the nation's largest natural gas production. I mean, those numbers are, uh, are astounding. Um, the one thing that I'm impressed with is, especially when you go on to a drilling site and you see the large footprint, but you go back several weeks later and you actually see what the final footprint looks like. Um, the scare tactics that are out there and documentaries and on websites, if that's all you read, um, you would think that this, uh, this industry is, is raping the land. And when you go back and seeing cows eating uh, you know, several feet from where the actual drilling takes place, I think it's pretty amazing what they, how they restore it um, and the amount of natural gas that, that could make us energy independent. When you think about, when you hear that Pennsylvania is sitting on the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, um, that's pretty, pretty powerful stuff that we could, you know, basically tell our enemies overseas that we don't need your product anymore. We're going to power ourselves, and uh, we're going to we're going to have our folks working in Pennsylvania to power America. That's pretty awesome. A large part of Act 13 was making sure that the local communities where the drilling was taking place would um, receive some some funds to help with the impacts of, of the industry and the trucks. What type of things um, might those communities need money for? Well, certainly um, roads, mm -hmm. uh, emergency response, I think is critical. Um, the, the road issue was addressed in prior legislation, but not to the level I think that, that was needed, so that was addressed in, in this bill. Um, I don't know, what are, what are the, some of the other areas, Jim? That well, I think, you know, in Beaver County, we're, we're, we want our folks to get these jobs and be educated and prepared to get these jobs so that we don't see West, you know, Vir uh, Texas and Oklahoma and Mississippi license plate. We want to see Pennsylvania license plate. But our, our, our folks need to be trained. And I would like to see some of those dollars, uh, especially in Beaver County, go to the community college so that they can have some capital money to start programs to train our folks so that they're ready for these jobs. Um, and, you know, in a lot of times in, in community colleges, uh, the local partner is county government. Um, and uh, I think that's a worthy investment so that that money is getting returned back to training our workforce. When I had the pleasure to sit down with Shell, they said there's three concerns we still have in Pennsylvania. We need a robust natural gas industry that's here for 50 years. We need our, your, your folks to be trained and prepared for our jobs. And the third thing is infrastructure. You know, are our roads that are already pretty dilapidated, are they going to be with able to stand this economic activity? And I would say the answer is right now no. Um, and the legislature and the governor need to find a way to fund transportation. Um, you had talked about the, the ethane cracker plan already. Can you explain what that is? I'll try. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, they take uh, the ethane out of the wet natural gas into Utica shale. 
um, which is in Ohio and, and western Pennsylvania. 70% um, of that is methane, which is just regular natural gas, and the other 30% ethane is in there. So they take the ethane and they make a product, uh, resin beads or all kinds of things that are used uh, to manufacture goods. Um, and plastics. then they, yeah, plastics. essentially, and uh, plastics are one, and uh, pharmaceuticals are another. Okay. They sell their end product to those manufacturers who make goods and then ultimately sell them. The great thing about the cracker is not just the 10,000 jobs it takes to build it or the thousand there, but they're they're buying their ethane from someone that's developing it and they're selling their end product. So what we've seen in the nation and the world when these crackers plans come in is we see a cluster of activity, whether it's developmental, uh, manufacturing, and that's where we can make tens of thousands of jobs for our folks. But we've got to remember this cracker is 12 miles from Ohio and 15 miles from West Virginia. We're still in competition for those cluster industries to come into Pennsylvania. And I think that's why the governor is, uh, came out with a, a tax credit to incentivize those companies in the cluster of industries to grow or even to bring more cra uh, cracker facilities um, because we are in competition. And the proximity to Ohio and West Virginia makes it a little more difficult uh, for us. And, and one of the areas of concern that the public has, and sometimes it's because all the facts aren't out there, and I, I tend to share, I guess, the position of, hey, we're willing to support, I am willing to support, but I need some more information. When, you, when you're um, facing a budget where we've talked earlier about cutting some programs, and then there's the um, uh, tax credit program giving $66 million a year to a large corporation, you know, the immediate um, reaction from some people was, well, why do we want to do that? And I think the, the devil's in the details, and in this case, I don't think it's going to be a devil. I think it's going to be an angel, and, and once those details come out, um, you know, we're, the governor announced yesterday, or said yesterday, that, you know, those tax credits are going to be used for Pennsylvania companies. They're not going to be going out of state. So it's those type of details that we need to get out there. You know, Jim talked earlier about, you know, the concerns of some of the residents in Pennsylvania about drilling and, and some of that negative press that's out there. Well, there isn't a legislator or an executive that wants to see anything bad happen environmentally. It's our responsibility to make sure that the laws are passed that protect Pennsylvanians and, and our resources first um, and then make sure that our departments enforce them. Um, so I, I feel very confident that, that's, that that is taking place and it's unfortunate that um, you know the press sometimes reports plane landings instead of all the plane I'm sorry the plane crashes uh -huh. instead of all the plane landings you know that we've had as it relates to natural gas. Uh, the Keystone Opportunity Zone program, that program was expanded and that was a big part of, of getting this plant to come. Uh, what is that program? Can you explain that for viewers? Yeah, it, it really creates an, an opportunity zone specifically where this cracker plant is going to be located, um, where there are economic tax benefits uh, to, the, to the company that, that works, it's going to be coming there. And that was one of the reasons, I think the reason that the announcement was made. Would that be fair to say? I, I think it's fair to say. And mm -hmm. I think when you have the second highest corporate net income tax in the world, as we, we have here in Pennsylvania, we have to either reduce that over time, or we've got to find ways to be competitive, entice businesses to come here. The Keystone Opportunity Zone has worked. The expansion, I believe, will work. And I, the, I think the best benefit for people in western Pennsylvania are these areas that used to have a lot of industrial activity and they were steel mills and now they're brownfield sites and this gives a, an incentive to business to come there uh, clean up the land and make sure it's environmentally safe and then put people back to work. Um, they're taking some pretty distressed wor uh, sites and cleaning them up and, and, and creating lots of jobs from it. And I think uh, it's been very successful and I'm glad uh, Mark and I and the governor and, and, and leadership uh, were able to get another expansion done. Mm -hmm. Well, this seems like a good point to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about some job creation efforts in the State House. Legislative report will return in just a moment. <laughs> Did you know that the chamber of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives contains a painting depicting the 24 hours of the day? Located in the center of the ceiling, the mural titled The Hours was created by artist Edwin Austin Abbey. This wonderful masterpiece charts the setting of the sun, moon, and the many stars that grace the heavens. 
24 maidens, who each represent an hour of the day, begin each day in light and gladness and ends in solemn drapery carried on still shoulders. Now you know. Did you know the Avenue of Flags presentation at Indian Town Gap National Cemetery has over 500 casket flags? Among the flags displayed are Commonwealth, Territorial, and Military flags. The flags are tied to 20-foot poles spaced 40 feet apart on both sides of the main drive of the cemetery. It takes about two hours to set up and take down all of the flags. Volunteers are encouraged to help with this task and must be at least 13 years of age. All of the flags are donated to the Avenue of Flags by families of the deceased. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. We've been discussing job creation and specifically the Marcellus Shale uh, natural gas drilling industry that is occurring in the state. Um, it's occurring basically in, I guess, maybe roughly two-thirds of the state, but the southeast is, and central Pennsylvania doesn't really have it in, in their area. Nonetheless, the effects do reach those areas as well. Can you talk about that as well? well from a consumer standpoint, we've seen 25 to 30 percent reductions in mm -hmm. the cost of gas to heat your home. So from that perspective, people are seeing a direct benefit to their pockets, which I think is a very, a very positive thing. Um, and there's going to be a lot of spin-off activity um, just in the conversion of vehicles um, to natural gas is going to be a, a huge industry. But we need to make sure that that supply that we're producing here in Pennsylvania stays here and is, is used um, in that perspective as well. One of the companies in my legislative district um, just purchased 200 tractor trailers that are going to be fueled by liquid natural gas. That's a significant, I mean, that's millions of dollars of investment, um, but they're going to be used right here in, in Pennsylvania and in northern West Virginia. So we're seeing that impact um, directly in, in the economy. And if we can start to think about what happens when mass transit would uh, uh, convert their buses over to natural gas, the, 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 the thought that they could reduce their gas bill by 60 percent is pretty astounding um, if they went off of uh, diesel generated buses and over to liquid natural gas. Um, the savings is there for the taxpayers, I think the savings is there for the consumers, but the key is I think, we, as Mark said, we've got to find the demand here in America um, because we have the supply and uh, you know the shareholders of these companies are interested in making money and that's that that may mean to, to export it to China or Japan uh, this natural gas I don't think Mark and I think that's good public policy we want to try to create a market where there's enough demand so that we keep it here um, because uh, I think that's what our constituents have demanded is they want to see the benefits not just the the jobs they want to see the benefits of the natural gas industry as well I was touring in my legislative district last week a, a small off airport property parking where you park there and they drive you to the airport and, and they're in the process now they have 10 vehicles where they're converting one of them uh, to natural gas so you know we're starting to see that happen and I expect that that will happen in a, at a much rapid play, much more rapid pace as we move forward. Overall what's your I guess personal philosophies on on where like the state legislature what their role should be in that is it uh, free market and hands off and allow it to develop on its own or or is there some incentivizing or something that the state legislature maybe should step in um, I, I I think the purest mindset that the free markets will take care of this I think is a little misguided I think government has to be a partner in this and an active partner um, I don't think that we have to run around with cardboard checks, but I do think we need to convert our vehicles, convert, convert our pumping stations, find ways on the turnpike and in our interstates to, uh, to have uh, uh, fueling stations. Um, I think there's, there's some tax credits out there that we could help incentivize mass transit, which is, you know, county government um, that needs cost savings very badly so that they can help their riders. Uh, give them a better service. I think this is an active partnership and government has to be uh, um, involved here pretty extensively to allow the industry to get up and running. A good example I think for people to visualize of government's involvement in infrastructure. 
um, is are a lot of those business parks that are around the airport in southwestern Pennsylvania and in, in the Hopewell area. Because what, what happens is um, when, when developers are looking for locations, Pennsylvania sometimes is not necessarily on that list because of the cost that it takes to move the dirt because it's such hilly terrain where if you went to South Carolina or North Carolina, they don't have those issues. So by government and by taxpayers, I shouldn't say the government, taxpayers investing in infrastructure, whether it's roads or water sewer infrastructure, we have a lot of pad ready sites and we've seen the benefit um, specifically in the um, Moon Township, Hopewell, Robinson Township areas, uh, North Fayette and Finley as well, we're surrounding the airport and, and those are buildings coming out of the ground, people working there, people working locally, they're not driving to Pittsburgh anymore, there's no need for buses to get there. So there's a lot of these additional cost savings that we're seeing and, and it's, uh, that's the similar type of mindset I think we need to look at when we think about natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, let's switch gears here and talk about some efforts to change the way things operate here in Harrisburg and the way government runs. Uh, Representative Christiana, I believe you had uh, <clears throat> a, a key role in something called Pen Watch. Can you explain what that is? Um, Pen Watch uh, is a, a bill that Governor Corbett signed to uh, pass the House and Senate unanimously, but what it does is it uh, puts the state checkbook on a website uh, for people to see where their dollars are being spent. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept, I think, but uh, um, ha Governor Rendell was reluctant to, to get on board, and thankfully when Governor Corbett came to town, he signed it pretty early on uh, in his first year. Um, what I, I, I will say, though, is that I think part of that movement is an effort by new rank and file here in Harrisburg to demand Harrisburg do it differently and to do things proactively. Representative Mustio and I and, and Representative Marshall, we voluntarily put all of our expenses on a website so that our constituents can see where we're spending our resources. Now, there's no law that mandate that 253 legislators do it. It's been a handful of a few legislators who have uh, proactively done it, and I think that will continue to grow. Um, it's the same concept as uh, my friend here, Representative Mustio, when he came out and said, I think politicians should contribute to your health care. Um, and uh, he was the first, the first uh, member of the legislature ever to contribute to his health care benefits by voluntarily writing a check. Fast forward a couple years later, um, both the House and the Senate are now contributing to their health care. So I, I think uh, we've heard the message from our constituents, and we've in turn uh, demanded um, some actions by the leadership here in Harrisburg. Yeah, it's been interesting, um, and Jim said it right when he said some of the newer members, because some of us were taking the initiative to, to walk the walk early on, but there wasn't that groundswell of support. Well, in the last couple of election cycles, um, the public has spoken and they've elected uh, people like Jim Christiana to come up here and, and, and make sure that um, these initiatives get pushed through. And, you know, he's young and he's creative and his mindset is let's think about how we can use technology to, to get these things done. And, and the pen watch by having, you know, everything transparent to the public, um, I think just builds that confidence and trust uh, that we have people that are working on their behalf in Harrisburg in a very open fashion and uh, he deserves a lot of applause for that. And Lori, I, I think too that uh, um, politicians need a way to change their pension benefit if they want a defined contribution. Give us an option to say, you know, the new members uh, say I don't want the pension, the public doesn't want me to have a pension, I think I should just have a 401k like the folks out in the real world. And I think that's the first step in this pension crisis is politicians leading by example. But we've got to give them an option. We don't even have the legislative uh, authority to do that. Before I can ask a teacher to go to a 401k, I think I should go to a 401k first and, or define contribution. Um, and uh, we need an option to do that. And I think uh, that will start the ball rolling to tackle the, one of the biggest crises I think we're going to be faced with, and that's the pension obligation. Oh, and that's very similar to... Um, the downsizing of the legislature. Yes. You know, we're seeing a lot of departments or even public schools, uh, you know, making some cuts and staffing changes. Well, I think from our perspective, you know, we need to take a look at ourselves first. And Speaker Smith had a bill that we were able to get out of the House of Representatives, cutting the House to 153 members and the Senate to 38, and that's sitting in the Senate, hopefully uh, waiting for them to have some action on it by the end of this year. And, and to me, that says, um, that speaks volumes to us leading by example, addressing our issues first, giving us credibility then to go into the other departments and say, okay, we've set the bar, now you go do the same thing. 
And I think a lot of credit goes, <coughs> excuse me, goes to the voters as well, because they've demanded for a while now uh, uh, that the members support shrinking the size of the legislature. And Representative Mustio, for consecutive terms, has introduced a bill to do just that. It wasn't until this year he had enough support within the House Republican leadership, as well as dozens of rank and file, uh, to join with his effort to get it done. So uh, I think it's a testament to the to the voters as well that if uh, they elect people they believe in that believe in these reforms and keep sending us back. Uh, we're going to keep uh, trying to deliver for them, and I think they have some results this time to show that we got the message. What do you think a, a smaller legislature would mean for the lawmaking process? Oh, uh, my. You know, it's interesting. Um, Sam Smith, who was the prime sponsor of the bill, was not traditionally for downsizing. Um, Representative Metcalf, who chairs the state government committee where this bill came out of, was not uh, in history of favor of doing this. But both have changed their minds. Uh, Sam. Uh, Representative Smith particularly seeing uh, the last budget process and how the Senate, a much smaller body, was able to get their 30 members, the Republicans, around a table and have a, a dialogue. And so his thought process was, you know what, if we had a lot uh, less members in the House, then the issues would be able to be able to be able to be debated uh, in a much more, um, I guess, expedient fashion. Um, members would be able to have that dialogue with each other and, and I think each member then would have a bigger territory but that would expose you uh, to some of the areas of the state that maybe you're not exposed to now you know a more rural area may have a little bit of a, a, a urban touch to it and you'd be more sensitive to those issues um, right now it seems it's almost an us against them mentality on some issues in this state and that's unfortunate and that creates gridlock um, whereas I think a much smaller accountable legislature would not would not do that it would kind of lessen the or spread out the diversity I guess is what you're saying I think so yeah. would you agree with that? Uh, I would agree I, I think uh, uh, what Representative Mustio said about the Senate and how they're able to work uh, much more uh, expediently is uh, a fact it's not an opinion. Well, it's um, numbers, 50 sure. compared to 203. Right. And uh, there was a time when maybe it wasn't uh, as easy to get your, your, your constituent service messages out. And, and, uh, but with technology now, with uh, the social media, with all the news coverage, uh, this isn't just the days of uh, a local newspaper, and that was the only way you got out information. Um, you can reach a lot of folks, uh, and uh, I think we can all um, grow a little bit. And I also think it's, a, uh, it's giving the, the, the public what they've demanded. And I think that's uh, part of it to me, too. And in addition, the public has more ways to uh, access the services that a district office would provide. They may not have to physically go to that district office in, in a way that they may have had to 20 years ago. Sure. I agree. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you both for the time that you spent today going over all these issues uh, for your constituents. And, uh, you know, as we move forward uh, with the session, I wish you well in your efforts uh, to not only uh, improve government and how it works, but also to create jobs in the state of Pennsylvania. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. Sure. That's all the time we have for today. If you have any questions about what we've discussed, feel free to contact Representative Mustio or Representative Christiana at their offices or through their websites. That information will be shown in just a moment. Thanks for watching Legislative Report.